Good morning. And Happy New Year. I appreciate the response. All right. <laughs> Man, wouldn't that have been awkward? So, um, I'm Andrew Cox. I'm one of the pastors here at First Christian Church of Johnson City. I'm excited to be here with you today. And if you're a guest, whether it's the first time or a few times, we're really excited to have you here. First day of the new year. That's impressive. Uh, if you see someone you don't recognize, just pretend like they don't go here. Introduce yourself. It'll make them feel welcome. It'll be a good way to start their year. So, yeah. Excited to be here. And uh, a little bit of news to kick us off. We just wrapped up a message, a series uh, called Home for Christmas. We wrapped it up last week. And today's a standalone message that we hope will help you kick your year off right. And it's all about New Year's. New Year's, it's a, it's a weird thing. Uh, we seem to practice it every single year, and it symbolizes a fresh start or a do-over, something of that nature. It may be one of the only moments in life that really makes us feel like we can actually start again. We only get but one first impression, one first date, one first day on the job, one first year in college. Life offers us a bunch of firsts and rarely gives us seconds. But New Year's gives us a sense we can really pull off who we think we should be. We can keep the house clean, manage that budget, pull off that elusive next belt loop as we lose weight throughout the year and maybe actually use that gym membership that's the kind of things that New Year's makes us think is possible. And when I think about New Year's and the newness it brings, I think about, for me, one of the most powerful examples of change that our world has ever shown us. The 80s movie montage. I love the 80s movie montage. You do too, you just don't know it. Let me explain. So the 80s movie montage is one of those few things in cinema where at the beginning some guy can be puny and lose a fight and by the end he can go and beat the big bad guy. At the beginning, you know, he, some kid's in a frumpy town that doesn't want to do anything fun and by the end everyone's dancing. It's an amazing example of change, the 80s movie montage. Like with Rocky, uh, he wakes up at 4 a.m. bright-eyed every day somehow. He's able to drink raw eggs out of a blender without ever giving salmonella. Uh, he's able to go to the gym, but it's not a normal gym. It's usually a barn or shadow boxing in the snow or behind a tractor for some reason. I picture scenes like that, but for my life, you know, like waking up at 5.30 in the morning instead, finally mastering the art of flossing. <laughs> I'm able to read a whole book before going to the gym and eat twice, no, no, three times before going into work, and I never gain a pound of fat. And the stressful days, they only make me look younger. I picture things like that. Maybe you do too. Can't you picture it? You're standing around looking at your house. Realize you're three springs late on spring cleaning. <laughs> so you put on a song like Everybody's Working for the Weekend or whatever your generation's version of that song is and magically your best friends from all phases of life pop out. How did they get in your house? They don't even have your address. But it doesn't matter. It's an 80s montage. So the song turns on. They're able to help you clean your house, build a new one, and paint it all in one scene. <laughs> I picture things like that. I picture scenes like that, but a year long when I think about what New Year's could be. I think you do too. You picture accomplishing all those goals and dreams. I picture me with all the good qualities, without all the bad ones. I imagine I can actually pull it off. And there's a thousand suggestions on how to do something like this online, like this one article from a website called Lifehacked. It's called uh, 50 New Year's Resolution Ideas and How to Achieve Each of Them. Uh, here's this one I thought was pretty good. It's on exercise. It says, uh, do one push-up and one pull-up every day this week. Add two every week. By the end of the year, you're doing 101 pull-ups and push-ups every day. Easy. Life hacked. They have plenty of suggestions about how to make you healthier, richer, more organized, more, well, everything you want more of. And I imagine if I did them, all 50, just 50, I would be able to have a different New Year's than last year or the year before that or, well, every year, really. And whatever I'm missing, this feeling I have inside that suggests I, I, I lack something, it'll just be magically gone if I did these 50 things. 
if I keep them. I mean, I'm supposed to keep them, like with dental care. I've heard for 27 years that I'm supposed to floss twice a day. I, I have yet to do that once. Uh, I have, I'll floss once a day, and I'll even do it for like a whole week, but I've yet to pull off the elusive twice a day flossing. It's like starting flossing is harder than quitting smoking. I, I can't quit <laughs> quitting is what I'm saying. You know what also I'm supposed to not do? I'll tell you. I'm not supposed to drink coffee late at night. You know you're not supposed to drink coffee late at night. It, it keeps you up, keeps you jittery, makes it hard for you to sleep. I'm also, I'm also not supposed to watch TV late at night. I'm not supposed to do that because the blue light keeps you awake and just makes it harder for you to sleep. But whether it's Sumatra dark roast with Seinfeld or a nice Americano with The Office, I have yet to find a night where those two things don't just go perfectly together. And for dessert, not flossing. That's my bedtime routine. <laughs> and the reason why I live this way, I know exactly why I live this way. The reason I can't get up and go to the gym early o'clock is because I go to bed late. And I go to bed late because I drink coffee late. And I drink coffee late so I can watch TV late. And the reason I watch TV late is because I made a commitment to someone I love to watch a show with them every weekday because it is a time for us to bond and that's important. Sometimes our plans are great, but life doesn't just perfectly fall into place for us to execute them. So I'm thinking these things to myself, these things I just told you while reading a life hacked article, and I'm sitting there reading through 50 things with like four to 10 suggestions each on how to pull these off, and I reached a conclusion, a conclusion that I think if you let yourself reach, you'd feel better about your year, and this is what it is. I'm not going to do any of these things. Not a single one. I mean, I'll pretend to, like last year. I'll even pretend to feel bad about it at 8.30, drinking a latte, mocking house hunters with my wife. <laughs> but the truth is, I already know that what these New Year's resolutions aren't going to make any difference. And it's fine, because I'm not sure these things will fix me, really. I, they won't make me new the way I want to be new, they may make me a little different, maybe better organized perhaps, but I don't think they'll really make a new me for this new year even if I kept them. And I think it's feelings like that, sensations like that, that can often bring us to the church. Because we want that newness that New Year's brings and we've heard stories and about how we can be the new us through the church, through Christ through God. And it's a good thing because God's in the business of making things new. Because He wants to. It's in His pleasure and in His will to do so. We try with resolutions to do new works in our own lives, and God has a better track record of keeping promises than we do. And He, and he can turn us around and put us in a new direction for 2017. And 2017 can become our year by letting it be God's year. But this thing, this change, isn't necessarily tied to a single moment or a, a quarterly review. We're not sure when this change that God promises He wants to make in all of us is going to happen. And that's reflected through verses like this in Proverbs 16.9. It says, In their hearts humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. And that's a great verse. But I don't like this verse very much. I get that it's supposed to be encouraging, that God has a plan. I, I just simply ask that he would let me in on it so I, I know I'm making the right choices along the way. Believe it or not, I would love to do the right thing. I'm just not sure I'm on the right path. I just want God to let me in on it. And in that area, I lack a little bit of faith. But I don't need to have faith in what is going to happen in my own life because God doing new works isn't well, it's not anything new. If you look throughout Scripture, you can see plenty of examples of God doing amazing things and very ordinary folks. So today, to symbolize this, to encourage us in that change, we're going to look at three stories of what happened to some people when God showed up. We're going to start with Moses. Moses did not have an easy start. See, Moses, for a little bit of background, he was raised in Egypt 
uh, as a slave because the Jews were slaves in Egypt at the time. And uh, the, the king, uh, the leader of uh, Egypt, Pharaoh, he said that he wanted to have all the firstborn sons killed. So uh, Moses was one of these kids and uh, turns out, because of a good case of luck, he ended up in the Pharaoh's palace raised by the Pharaoh's daughter. See, a lot of us, we don't get a good, easy start, but we get a hold of this one good moment in life, this one good thing we don't want to let go of. And that this was Moses's. He had all the great opportunity, all the wealth, all the riches that could be provided in that time. Do you ever feel that way? Like, you look at this one moment and go, I can't let this one slip up. Maybe it was when you met your spouse or this job opportunity, but you go, I can't mess this one up. But Moses is, is uh, unfortunately very normal. And he has a simple problem. He has an anger problem. It's a simple problem, but it turns into a big issue. He ends up uh, killing a guy. He has to flee town to avert a murder charge. And he settles down away from his rich life where he had all these opportunities where he probably felt like a failure off in the wilderness as some poor shepherd. With a life like that, with a problem like Moses had, like problems we've had in our lives, we look at God and we look at our world and we go, well, I may be a little too far gone because of my mistakes for this to turn around. So his plans, his New Year's resolutions were probably very simple ones. Once he knew he could achieve, once he knew he would be better if he pulled off, like, listen better to my wife. Add variety to my dinner choices. Visit the in-laws more often. Shear the sheep. Stay awake while watching the sheep. Don't feed the sheep too much, or too little for that matter. He probably had a lot of resolutions involving sheep is what I'm saying. But while he was busy trying to handle his day-to-day as a shepherd, God had much bigger plans for him. God showed up in a very big way. It, the scene is the burning bush. Uh, if this were a movie, it would be one of the highest grossing special effects of the year. It's a great scene. Uh, it, it's an op- awesome opportunity for uh, a movie production. And so in this moment, uh, Moses finds himself being called to something greater through God's will. And this is what it was. God said, now Moses, I know you know what happens in Egypt. I want you to go to the place you know, to the Pharaoh, to get the people you know out of captivity, which I know you know about. And bring them through the wilderness you have gotten to know this whole time as a shepherd. That's a very interesting story for me because God did a new work in him and turned him around and sent him in a new direction. A direction that, when he looked back, made all his resolutions obsolete. All his plans far too small. And the path that God set him on made every moment in his life a moment that mattered. A moment that led him to where he was. Now sure, if Moses would have kept his New Year's resolutions, he would have been a better son-in-law, a better husband, a better shepherd. But you would have never heard of him. He wouldn't have even been a blip on history's radar. And his story wouldn't be told. It wasn't that Moses' plans were too big. They were too small. God's plans were so much bigger than Moses' biggest plans. I think about guys like Moses. I also think about guys like Peter. I love Peter. Peter's one of those guys that makes me feel like I have a chance to be extremely successful in life. He's a, he's he's kind of a jerk. He's he's a type A personality. He has a temper. He's a shoot first, ask questions later type, you know. Uh, He's the kind of guy with an average reading level and average education that goes on to do grand things, you know? Real underdog story. I like Peter a lot. He's the kind of guy that I can look up to. So here's this guy, Peter. Maybe you can relate to him in a couple ways because he's a a middle-class citizen. He's a business owner, fisherman by trade, just trying to do what he thought he should do. Never encountered Jesus before this moment. So his New Year's resolutions probably looked something like this. Make more money this year. Do well at my job. Get in fewer fist fights with the guys. <laughs> Buy a new net. Little things that would have gone a long way for a fisherman like Peter 
But he was called to something more than that, just like you are. We are all called to something more than that because we're meant for more than work and taxes and our resolutions should not reflect that that's all we're made for. These resolutions are admirable, honestly. He would be a better example, a better worker, a better husband. But these things, even at his highest bar for the year, are so far below God's plans for him. And for you as well. He was meant for more than he could possibly imagine, so God met him head on. Jesus met him and, ha- and helped him move in a new direction. So P- Peter's resolutions probably shifted as a follower of Jesus. He went around with Jesus, heard the teachings of Jesus, saw the miracles of Jesus. So he probably became a person that looked a little bit more like Jesus, and he wanted to follow good Christian plans the way us good Christians want to follow good Christian plans. But then he got some rough news. He heard from Jesus that someone was going to betray him. So he had to react. He had to do what any of us would do if we heard there was bad news for a friend or a teacher. He adjusted his plans and his resolutions for that year probably looked something like, well, be the rock for the other disciples to lean on. Uh, protect Jesus at all costs. If anyone gets too close, cut the guy's ear off. You know, things like that. He would have been someone who made sure to protect Jesus at all costs because he thought that was his job as a follower to do his plans. And everything was on track until Jesus got arrested. And then Jesus died. See, the main story of Christianity is that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. And this sacrifice allows that we can be a part of the adopted family that that is of Christ, that we may be in heaven one day with God. And that is amazing. That is the most powerful story that has ever been told. But for Peter, in this moment, he hadn't heard the whole story yet. We rarely get the whole story. All he saw was his friend and teacher getting killed and buried. So he did what a lot of us do when our plans don't work out, even our good ones, our good Christian ones. He stopped believing as much. He stopped following so strongly. He even denied Jesus a few times. Oftentimes we find ourselves in a tough spot with little faith that we can rely on, so we, we do what we know best. We lean on material things, and for Peter that meant fishing. He went back to his fishing. But then Jesus rose from the dead and went out to, fe- to Peter's fishing spot and called Peter back from exactly where he found him in the first place into a new plan. i got to say that again. That is such a, that's such a great story. So, we have all walked away from God at different points in our life. Let's not pretend like we didn't. And here we have Peter going all the way back as if he had never met Jesus to his career of fishing. He went all the way back to the beginning. And Jesus, resurrected, went right up to the shore and called Peter back out of it again as if he had never left in the first place. So Peter's plans changed again. His uh, resolutions were renewed into something new. So at this point, just so we're clear, Peter had failed at every single resolution he had ever set. Every single one. Every goal, every plan was torn apart by God showing up. God's plans ruined Peter's resolutions because when God said go, Peter said yes. From there, Peter goes on to be a great teacher of the gospel. He becomes an influencer of the world. He ends up eventually teaching Paul. And if you don't know who Paul is, Paul is this guy who wrote like half of the New Testament. Very important figure in our faith. And this is Peter's legacy. So for Moses, we have his resolutions are too small and trivial. And for Peter, they were just completely off base, even though great intended. So you can imagine where the next part of the sermon goes, right? This is the part where I tell you that this can happen for you too. And I, and I am going to, and I do mean that. 
But a lot of us seem to lack the faith to believe that these stories in the Bible can be such a renewal for us, that we could even, that we could even grasp for a moment a fraction of the generosity of the heart of God and emulate it in our own lives. The thought that we could be as generous with our neighbors as God is generous with his forgiveness, as generous with our forgiveness of others as God is loving towards us. But we often feel like that's the story for the person beside us in the pew and not ourselves. That's a great story, but that's for him. I can't do that. Maybe this is a little too optimistic for you. You don't feel like God shows up in that way in your life. Or, so you feel, well, it makes you feel alone. Or like your story doesn't matter that it can't be redeemed or new. That's why I like this third person. I think that her story fits because she probably felt this way. Mary Magdalene. I love her story. She's one of the characters in the story of Jesus. She isn't exactly what you would call a role model. A lot of a the stories that are prescribed to her in the New Testament aren't exactly pure ones. She's involved in Jesus' life, but you don't see her doing much. You see a lot of things happening to her. That's the kind of life she lived. I don't even know how to picture the kind of resolution she might hold. I mean, everyone knew Mary, but only as much as you wanted to. She wasn't a woman of great reputation, and if there were posters made of her in the first century, they probably weren't hanging on any little girl's ceilings. You may not even call her a lady if you're in the South. Her occupation was immoral, and she was passed around by people. And people like that often don't feel worthy of love. So maybe her resolution was more customers, better bed linens, make more money, more expensive perfume to attract wealthier Johns. But honestly, after the way she had been treated verbally, physically, I don't know if she would have had any resolutions. And here's the saddest part. She's just a side character. Do you ever feel that way? Like just a footnote in someone else's better story? the less successful sibling, so you hate the holidays. That one relative always reminds you of what's going on that you did 10 years ago so you can't escape who you were in hopes of who you could be. People like that often feel irrelevant, and I imagine that that's how Mary felt. (laughs) Maybe she didn't make any resolutions. Commit to what exactly? But one day something changed. See, Mary had a habit of going to the tomb after the death and burial of Jesus. The text is in John 20. It'll be up here on the screen if you want to read along. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't even recognize him. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? What are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. So she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get to him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around and cried in Aramaic, Teacher. Jesus said, Don't hold on to me. I have yet to ascend to the Father. Go instead to the brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And just like that, this woman who we always attribute stories of ill repute, 
Stories of a great need of graciousness, because look at the way she's living, becomes the first to proclaim sentences similar to, He is risen. Just like that, such a small sentence, such a small act of obedience, but with such an amazing ripple effect. God's work in our lives isn't dependent on our resolutions, but it's dependent on our responses. The deciding factor in how new this new year will be won't be your resolutions and how well you follow them. It'll be God's calling on your life and how fully you follow that. These stories are about murderers, off-balance people, the immoral, fearful, bullheaded, unworthy. God stepped into their lives and changed them. They started out the year one way, and by the end, it was altogether different. They started off with big, impressive plans, cosmically important plans, plans to change the world, plans like stop drinking as much soda, fit back into my wedding dress, make more money, read more books. The way God seems to behave is he redeems us from our past and from our plans. And he did a new work in these people. The crazy part is this stuff really happens. This actually happens. In times like Moses and Peter and Mary, it was common. It wasn't rare at all. And doing new things is God's standard operating procedure. God takes regular lives and makes them amazing. And it's not like the desire to lose a few pounds or become financially independent are bad ones. They're just not world-changing ones. That shouldn't be the top bar. No historian references this as a change of history, and it won't be the example in anyone's graduation speech, so our bar should be as high as God's desire for our lives, as high as a calling from God looks. Because when God says go, we say yes. Read along with me, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. For the love of Christ urges us on. Because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us a ministry of reconciliation that this In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and and entrusting a message of reconciliation to them. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God makes all things new. He did it with Moses and Peter and Mary Magdalene. God wants to do a new work in your life. You don't have to be someone out of the ordinary for God to show up. Moses wasn't aware that the bush wouldn't burn. Peter wasn't aware that Jesus would show up on shore. And Mary didn't know the stone would roll away. It's exciting the way that God chooses to interact. He shows up in unexpected ways in our year, and then from there on, our year is changed. A new work is done. We don't know what's in store for us. We don't know the new work God has in store for us. And we don't know the path that he will turn us on. But when God says go, we say yes. 
Proverbs 3, 5-6 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways submit to Him and He will make your paths straight. God is busy doing these sorts of works all the time. And maybe you don't fit into the categories of the people I mentioned today. Maybe you're not one of these people. You don't feel like you've had these great opportunities or that you messed up big time or you feel like your story is normal. I am so sorry that our sensational society taught you that your story is somehow subpar. Let's go back to the story of Mary. Uh, She didn't tell her story. That's not what made her exciting. That's not what made her impressive. What made her so amazing throughout history is the fact that she was willing to tell the story of Christ in obedience. That's what made her impressive. And one moment of Mary telling the words to the disciples turned into Peter's sermon, which turned into the teaching of Paul which turned into the planting of churches and writings of epistles and the greatest shift in the intellectual, philosophical, economical views of the entire world to date because of obedience. If you're wondering if you're called, I think this is a good way to look at it. God calls who he loves. And God loves who he has made. And God has made every single one of you. So yeah, you may fail your New Year's resolutions. You may not become the person that you wish you would be by December 2017. You may not lose that weight, make that money, floss. Take that romantic life to the next level. But God's success has never been contingent on your dental habits, your weight loss, or your ability to fulfill your personal promises to yourself. That's not how he works. So you may feel this calling on your life, this pull at the center of your chest, a whisper that sounds a little too unrealistic for you to personally pull off. That's probably God. To be called into a generosity where you love all your neighbors, you know, even the weird one. Where you're friendly to all the people at work, especially the one that gets on your nerves. Where you develop friendships, not because they follow the same God as you, but because they were made as this, by the same God as you. Where you look like Jesus in every phase of your life. That's the story that you are supposed to live out. That's the story you were called to. It's a story of total reconciliation. Where he makes all things new. Just like this year. Just like you. Let us pray. God, we come to you not with great words, but simply a heart of question and hope that you may do something in our lives that we have yet to understand. Not because our life needs to be the one that is changed, but because we have been so touched by the generosity of a God that would die for us, that we hope in some way that we can be that for others. That we can be such a shining example of who you were. People will follow us because they think we look like you. Please show us what it means to be your disciples like Peter. Those who hold your mission like Moses. And in moments of obedience, (laughs) proclaim your amazing story like Mary. God, touch our hearts. Do not let these words fall on deaf ears. Allow us to see the splendor and glory and the overwhelming generosity of a God who would exit heaven just to die on earth because he wanted us to love him and because he loved us too. Be with us today, be with this year that we may look with new eyes into a different kind of world where our plans are not made by what we promised ourselves in December 2016, but our promises are made in 
daily habits of self-sacrifice that we may look more like you and practice what you practice so that everyone will be as loved as those who were closest to you. Please be with us in that way, God. Show us what it means to look more like your son. In your name I pray. Amen.